my mom was at a distance and not there locally as I would have preferred, but the schedule wouldn't allow that. What I'd like to talk about today is long-term outcomes after successful treatment of TTP. This is obviously meant to be a very informal presentation, and typically I say if you have any questions, feel free to just yell them out. You can still do that, uh, but this is a tape broadcast, so I won't hear you. So historically, uh, you know, prior to the advent of successful therapy of TTP, plasma exchange therapy, which was really uh, shown to be the standard of care in TTP in 1991 by Dr. Rock uh, and her collaborators, uh, transformed a disease which was obviously uniformly fatal nearly before to one where the majority of patients, um, more than the majority of patients, will survive now with mortality rates of only 10 to 20 percent. Um, with this increasing number of survivors, now we're available, we have patients now to evaluate for long-term issues and long-term complications. So with this increasing pool of survivors for now, what is over 20 years, the question could be asked, what took so long uh, to really pick up these problems? And I think it relates to a couple of issues. Um, the continuity of care issue is the primary one. These patients are typically seen by referral centers, tertiary care centers, and referred back to their local hematologist, so not followed by that same physician. I think the local physicians with Lexus experience in TTP typically would see a normal platelet count, um, say the patient felt fine overall hematologically, and said they were fine, didn't follow the patients, or just presumed because the platelet count was fine that they were fine. What we've seen in the last couple of years with, with the research programs and the emphasis on longitudinal follow-ups is really learning more and more about these patients. So groups such as the Oklahoma group, uh, our group here at Ohio State, as well as the UK group uh, in London, to name just a couple, have really been following patients longitudinally to really get a better handle on what happens long-term to these patients after they recover from a previous episode of TTP. I think what's been most important are these TTP patient groups that I think here, and I hope many of you have had a chance to participate. Um, the first one was at the University of Oklahoma, really started in 1996, and really were set up as an open forum for patients to discuss their experiences, problems, things that they were having as they were now in remission from TTP. Um, what was really noted by Dr. George and his group was that these patients who were thought to be normal hematology were describing long-term complications and problems that really hadn't been characterized or even known to exist before. This led to one of their first studies, uh, now several years ago, it was published in 2009, but they looked at 24 patients with a previous history of TTP. All of these patients were severely deficient in terms of Adam TS or teen activity at presentation. Their physical exam was normal. Uh, they had a normal mini mental status exam, which was used as a screening uh, for dementia. So as far as one could tell, these were essentially normal patients and were what we had all said before, normal doing fine from their TTP. What they did in this study was formal neurocognitive testing, um, testing administered by a trained neuropsychologist. And what they found was somewhat striking, really confirmed what they saw in these patient group meetings and what patients were telling people uh, and telling uh, this group of physicians. That as a group, um, in, they did poorly, significantly worse in four of 11 of these cognitive domains that were tested. And some of these domains that they did more poorly on were complex attention, concentration skills, sort of information processing speed, rapid language generation, memorization, sort of what we really had seen in the clinic. Our patients will come in, we'll ask questions, and many times there's a short pause before they answer. When they go to their cell phone to dial a number or to type something in, there was sort of a slight pause. And they would also describe short-term memory issues, being told something. Uh, and, and having to ask the question again and having family members being frustrated, saying that I just told you that, uh, can't you remember that? So it's sort of very subtle things. If you look at these patients as a whole, they may seem perfectly normal, but when you delve a bit deeper and ask and understand these issues, these certainly are quite prevalent uh, in these patients. What was also very interesting is that, that age, uh, the features of their TTP presentation, a number of episodes, so multiple episodes versus single episodes or interval from the last episode, really didn't seem to predict um, these abnormalities in these patients. So it wasn't real clear who was going to get in trouble, but just having a previous history of TTP could get you in trouble with these complications. So following this, we did a study in collaboration with Dr. Marie Scully uh, and 
and University College of London group looking at and trying to really formally and objectively measure some of these long-term complications. This study was funded by the Archimix Corporation uh, at the time was doing an A1 domain blocking uh, study. Uh, the study was stopped prematurely, but as they lead into this clinical trial, they wanted to document sort of end organ complications and injury in these patients. So it was sort of a complicated study in that many things were done, including a clinical assessment, uh, biomarkers of neurocognitive injury, the S100 beta, neurocognitive testing. In this case, we did a more uh, really straightforward uh, laptop-based, computer-based testing, as well as imaging studies with MRI and quality of life assessment with a standardized, uh, validated quality of life survey. So looking just at the neurocognitive testing that, that was performed, again, this was using the COGSTATE test, which is a very interesting neurocognitive test battery. What's unique about this is it doesn't require a trained neuropsychologist to administer the test. They can take the test themselves on a laptop. There is a large reference data set from the normal population. And it's been validated and useful for detecting disease-related and drug-related neurocognitive impairments. So it's really a long history using this uh, cog state testing. Five tests were, were used in our patients. It was called a detect detection test, which was essentially looking at a deck of cards and a face card. And what they were asked to do was say, push a button when this card is turned over. Mm -hmm. The identification task. Uh, is one when they were asked, is this card red or is this card black? One card learning, they were shown on this laptop screen um, and asked, have they seen this card before? Sort of a test of visual learning and memory, trying to test that short-term memory. The one back memory test, they were asked, was this card the same that you saw previously? And a test that was a bit more complicated, unable to be completed by a majority of our patients, this Grove maze learning test, sort of testing their ability to work through a maze on the laptop. So what's nice about these tests, uh, they can be done objectively very quickly, relatively quickly compared to neurocognitive tests. And again, they could be validated and, and compared to a larger, larger database. It also was language and um, intellect independent. So it was just using a deck of cards, which most people are very familiar with. So the first test is this Groton um, learning test was, was not used because nine of 20 were not able to complete the test. But what was somewhat striking in that, looking at 18 of 29 patients that were studied, so 62% of patients were at least one standard deviation below age-matched norms, at least one of these four tests. Uh, just over half of patients scored below two standard deviations on at least one of four tests, and 45% uh, were at least one standard deviation below age mass norms on at least two of the four tests. And these last two criteria are what were used to define neurocognitive impairment, being below one standard, below two standard deviations, I should say, um, on one test or below one standard deviation on at least two of these four tests. So that was the definition of neurocognitive impairment. To sort of put it in the terms that we all understand, you can see at the bottom um, the different tasks that were studied and measured. The comparison of the, of the TTP patients, the TMA patients, was shown here in red. Um, in light blue, you can see the line, uh, the test results from a large cohort of patients with blood alcohol content of 0.08%, something we can all relate to. But you can also see uh, dementia patients in the gray and in the bluish purple depression patients. I think it's quite striking and surprising that these TMA patients, primarily TTP patients, really perform much worse uh, than some of these benchmarks that we see, especially this blood alcohol content, and really start to approach dementia in many respects, which is quite surprising as well as concerning. We also compared as part of this study these neurocognitive deficits to MRI imaging abnormalities. And was in the 15 of 29 patients that did have neurocognitive impairment, half of them had abnormal MRIs. Nine of the 23 patients who had an abnormal MRI, and this was typically microvascular injury that was picked up, seven of these nine also had objectively documented neurocognitive impairment. So it certainly seems as, as we would expect that the neurocognitive testing um, is a bit more sensitive than more sensitive than the MRI imaging for detecting uh, CNS injury, which is really what you might expect. 
So this really got our attention and caused us to start looking at our cohort of patients and see what was really happening long term. So what we did was take a cohort of our patients with a history of multiple relapses of TTP um, and looked at 22 patients at presentation and during a follow-up, which was a meeting of about five years. So at presentation, 80 percent, uh, nearly 80 percent had proteinuria, which is a marker of kidney injury, uh, and 68 percent had increased serum creatinine. But during follow-up, most normalized their kidney function as we measure it. There was no cardiac finding. There were two patients, however, who were found to have newly diagnosed hypertension, which I think will be important later as I show some of Dr. George's more recent data. What was somewhat striking, though, in the two patients that died during this follow-up period, these were both patients who died of complications of their TTP not related to acute episode. One patient um, with a cardiac complication we think died of an arrhythmia soon after achieving remission and actually being discharged home. The day before had normal platelet count, normal LDH, and was thought to be hematologically normal. Uh, the other patient, where we have some of the slides from her histologic session shown here, was recovering from a TTP episode and seemed to have a cardiac arrhythmia mediated by a hyperkalemia load that she really couldn't handle or tolerate. It seemed that it was out of what she could really handle in terms of her kidney function and cardiac. And we look at some of the histological sections, they were really quite striking. So this is in the context of a patient thought to have essentially normal kidney function. The serum creatinine remission would normalize, was not thought to have cardiac complications. But this was a young woman with at least five to six recurrences of TTP um, and in her young 30s. And, and as our pathologist told us, the sclerotic glomeruli we see here uh, were that of somebody who had long-standing, he thought, many, many years of hyper. Tension. And the hypertrophic myocytes seen in the slide on the right um, sort of suggested, of, again, chronic end organ damage uh, from, they thought, hypertension, but certainly not a long standing history of hypertension in this patient, just her thrombotic glycogenopathy.